Dockery Farms was established by Will Dockery in 1895 to produce cotton, America's most important export of the 19th and early 20th century. African Americans who came to Dockery to cultivate that cotton created a culture that inspired the music we know as the blues. In the words of B.B. King, you might say, it all started right here. We took a trip to see this farm for ourselves on the Mississippi Blues Trail. So meet us at the table for another adventure from the Delta. I'm Lainey. And I'm Laura Beth. And we are Steel Magnolias. The strength of steel with the grace of a magnolia. We are here to have uplifting conversations about life in the South. And we've got plenty of room at our table. So pull up a chair. Well, if you follow this show closely, you know that at the end of March, we visited Mississippi for the second time since having this podcast. That's actually the only two times we've ever been there. So much history that we've learned about and culture that we've experienced and we just felt like we're gonna have to divide this up into several episodes so that's what we're doing that's right just spread them out yes today is the final episode from our delta travels and we are excited to talk about dockery farms located in cleveland mississippi that's in the northern part of the state two hours north of the capital jackson two hours south of memphis so it's just right there between memphis and jackson so, thank you, Lainey, for finding this place. Yeah. Because this was not at all something I had heard of or had on my radar whatsoever. Well, there's not a lot happening there right now. Right. And so, but if you are at all a um, music lover, specifically blues in particular, this was an important place. Yes. Yeah. So, let me give a little history and then we'll jump into our interview with the executive director of the Dockery Farms Foundation. So in 1865, Will Dockery was born in Mississippi. That's the same year the Civil War ends with the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery being ratified. Will Dockery was the son of a Confederate general that died at the Battle of Bull Run, and he founded the plantation that we're talking about today. So a very young Will Dockery, he had graduated from the University of Mississippi in 1885, he received a gift of a thousand dollars from his Can you grandmother. At that time? Hello, yeah. that's a huge inheritance. So he purchased a forest and swamp <laughs> land in the Mississippi Delta near the Yazoo and Sunflower Rivers. He recognized that the soil was rich. He cleared the woods out. He drained the swamps, and he opened the land for cotton. So he's got the lands, and word gets out. You know. He needs some workers. So families began to, African-American families began to flock to Dockery Farms in search of work in the fields and as tenant farmers, you hear them called? Sharecroppers. Sharecroppers, yeah. exactly. So they were offered very fair contracts to labor and he even set it up to allow them to prosper as well. Not just going back to a slave type model, but wanted them to feel empowered as well. So he had earned a good reputation for treating his African-American workers and sharecroppers very fairly, which, of course, attracts even more people. Yeah, because the whole region wasn't like that. Oh, no, 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 no. So at one point, I mean, we got anywhere from one to 4,000 men working at this Dockery Farms. And you haven't mentioned the acreage. 30,000, almost 30,000 acres. Yes. That's so unbelievable. And so this is now mid-1930s. We've got about 30,000 acres, around 40 square miles of very fertile, rich land. And, and so Will Dockery managed the land until the 1930s when his son, Joe Rice Dockery, took over and maintained, and maintained the plantation through the Great Depression until his death in 1982. And then his widow... Keith Dockery McLean then ran the farm, which diversified to produce corn, 
rice, soybean. And in 1994, she turned the farm over to some hired managers. And it was really her that, you know, realized the national significance of Dockery Farms in terms of being the hotbed of blues music and was really prideful of the farm's significance as a source of that blues music. So since her death in 2006, her granddaughters and grandchildren have owned Dockery Farms and they've established a foundation in hopes to fund research into even more archives of the Delta Blues music. Well, while we're talking cotton, nothing brings about really restful good sleep like cotton sheets. Lainey and I have been lucky to be sleeping on the most luxurious sheets from Bowl and Branch. The cool- coolness and silky soft texture has certainly been helping my restless nights. I'm really pleased with the color pewter that I chose, but all of the subtle colors they have can go with lots of different looks. They are made without toxins, free from synthetic pesticides, formaldehyde, and other harsh chemicals. Sleep better at night with Bowl and Branch sheets. Get your 15% off your order when you use promo code Steel Magnolias at bowlandbranch.com. That's Bowl and Branch, B O L L A N D, branch.com. Promo code Steel Magnolias. Exclusion supply. See site for details. We are grateful for their support of this show. All right, back to it. So, right when we pulled onto the property, you see the seed house. Uh, There was once a train depot that was across the road. So the sign that's painted is really big on the side of the seed house. You know, it says Dockery Farms really big. We'll have some photos that we'll put up on our Instagram this week. And that was so that you could see what stop you were at. Yes. When you're getting off the train. Yeah, because obviously the train depot is not there now. Yes, exactly. So we saw the cotton gin. You can actually walk inside and see all of the original equipment. The gin ran 24 hours a day. As I mentioned, um, corn was also grown here, and they did rice and soybeans. They also raised cows. And at one time, this place had a post office. Commissary. Yes, commissary. Um, I mentioned the, the cotton gin. And so a very significant family moved here in 1900. I'm saying significant. They weren't significant at, at, the, time, at the moment. Yeah. Although, yes, in, in God's eyes, we're all significant. All significant, right. But you know what I mean. Uh, Bill and Annie Patton and their 12, yes, I said 12 <laughs> children, took up residence at Dockery Farms. Their nine-year-old, Charlie, took to following guitarist Henry Sloan and would follow him around at picnics and social gatherings and and anytime he could be around him apparently he wanted to so by 1910 Patton himself was a professional musician so he would have been about 19 then okay so the plantation employed Charlie Patton but like I said he's also growing in this profession of musicianship And he is a legendary blues musician who then went on to inspire other great artists like Elvis Presley, Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, B.B. King. Yes, Robert Johnson. Yeah, many of these also in the Delta. So even if you don't know the name Charlie Patton, that's okay. You know people that... Were influenced. were influenced by him. I would even say, you know, we've mentioned before that some of the museums that we've been in recently have it set up so well that you can get to see who was an influencer to another artist, who was a peer to another artist. Who yeah, did, you know, that's so helpful. All of it. With the time spans and all. Um, I kind of, in my head, did some jumping around to try and think, okay, I th- that Howlin' Wolf, I haven't listened to much of his music, but if you do like the Rolling Stones... Go back and listen to Howlin' Wolf, and you will definitely hear that he was highly influential on their um, artistry, for yeah. sure. And so think back from Howlin' Wolf, then he was influenced by this Charlie Patton that we're talking about. Well, one other thing I was thinking about when we were walking around at this farm is just how, you know, there there wasn't a lot to do for entertainment. Right. 
or resources for entertainment. Now, most of these people lived here for on, sure. on this farm. So they live there, they work there, they spend their money there. Which, yes. Were you going to go into that? The Well, in our interview, you're going to hear a okay. little bit about what the currency, even how they how they traded, how they exchanged. Yeah. You'll hear so a little bit about that. So fascinating to me. But obviously, um, with these people all living on this property together, you really could follow around, follow somebody around oh, yeah. in their off hours to learn yeah. from them yeah. and be influenced by their music style. Yeah. The other thing I was thinking about, actually even just on my way over here today, was how wild it must have been to be in a field or any work environment all week long in silence or only the chatter of people working around you and to have this opportunity of hearing somebody playing guitar oh yeah how special that is like even as we're recording this podcast right now we can hear music like booming at a nearby house that is just like having a party rocking out <laughs> It, music is just so much in the background of our lives. So true, but it, not there. And to think that like that was such a special thing to get to hear any musician, right? Just that's I, so funny. I just was thinking it's so true, and even that probably plays into kind of why some of the things sound like like a train or something. Like these are the sounds they know as they're out there working. And that's so true, and. Just to even think about, you're going to hear in our interview that the people that lived there, they're they're earning what is a good wage for the times, but still way harder work than what oh, the wage God. was. They're yeah behind, and they're willing mules, to, right? That are plowing, and so you yeah you'd think, well, then why would you spend any money if it was that hard to earn on going to hear? somebody play music because well, that's cause entertainment. It was so rare yeah. yeah it's all you got and music is very life-giving for sure and you know that brings about dancing and all kinds of fun yes, things when yes. there's music yes so let's go ahead and jump in to our interview we got to speak with William Lester he's the executive director of the Dockery Farm Foundation he's a historian he taught at Delta State for 38 years, and he's also an artist. He was a very, very interesting interview. I could have talked to him all day, but he was just, yeah, full of stories. He himself is a storyteller. That's true. That's true. So let's listen in as Will describes to us what Dockery Farms was like in, 19, in the 1915 and even into the 1920s. Specifically, the house on the property where he says the blues was born. My name is William Lester, and I'm the executive director of the Dockery Farm Foundation. About 15 years ago, uh, the Dockery family uh, asked me would I uh, take over that position and help uh, uh, restore the site and keep it up and uh, make it uh, a welcoming place for all the visitors we get. If you look at one of our sign-in sheets right here, uh, this is for one day now. This is Paris, France, Italy, uh, London, Zurich, New Orleans, Memphis, Spain, West Point, Mississippi. Look at there. Let's see where else. Guatemala, Israel, uh, Cape Carroll, Florida. And so we have people from all over the United States come here every day. And they want to see the birthplace of the blues. And when B.B. King was here <clears throat> in 1973, well, he claimed that Dockery is the birthplace of the blues and that Charlie Patton is the father of the blues. And one of those reasons that that's true is that this physical setup we have here at Dockery. Uh, a lot of people think that uh, the blues in the 1915s and 20s was played at um, uh, what we call juke joints. Right. But but they just weren't they just weren't any juke joints in the Delta. There might have been some in New Orleans and Memphis and maybe Nashville, but 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 there were none in the Mississippi Delta. But what they had was they had frolicking houses, and the, you know the bluesmen uh, you know were not. Um, um, uh, uh, totally uh, incapable uh, of not promoting themselves. I mean, they, they know what to do. Tom Cannon was alive when I first moved here 50 years ago. That was big Charlie Patton's nephew. He was 14 when his uncle died. And he told me Charlie Patton was the only black man that wore white man Sunday school clothes and drove a brand new car. 
Okay. Said the rest of us were barefoot and riding mules. He said Charlie was a real man. I just graduated from Ole Miss 50 years ago, and I had black curly hair, and I thought I was cool. And I said, you mean he was cool? And that old black man looked at me, and his eyes got all squinted up, and he said, no, Mr. Bill, he weren't cool. He was tight. He said ah. tight is way better than cool. <laughs> and so I thought, man, what a trick. But anyway, the Frolicking House. What, why, you know, what happened? That well, name says a lot. Yeah, but tell oh, us yeah, about a Frolicking yeah, well, House. I asked Tom Cannon, I said, uh, did you ever get to go see Charlie play at the Frolicking House? He said, no, Mr. Bill, you know, he died when I spoke to him. And he said, you couldn't go to the Frolicking House until you were 15. And stupid me said, well, why? He just grinned real big and said, cause, Mr. Bill, they frolic there. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, I got you. And so, now, what about the frolicking house? How did it work? Well, back then there was no electricity, no running water, no tractors, no chainsaws. Definitely no No cell phone. phones, no nothing. All right, so, so how did they actually do it? Well, I hear again, they weren't stupid. Uh, they wanted to draw a large crowd. So these people work from what you call kin to kin from when they can see in the morning to when they can't see at night. And so on Saturday night late, uh, when these blue singers would come here and play, they had talked to Big Lou. The Big Lou had taken all the furniture out of his house. He'd raised the windows. The bluesmen had bought giant mirrors for him, bigger than this one right here, bigger than this. For each wall, I graduated from Ole Miss twice. I can't read and write, but I can count. That's 16 mirrors. He had four rooms, one mirror on each wall, 16 mirrors, and they would hang a chain from the ceiling and put a coal oil line in, it, in front of it and, and uh, in front of each mirror. Now somebody's calling me from New York. I got the possibly the answer. But anyway, one of my bosses. Anyway, the mirror would, well, uh, that's okay. The, the chain would hang from the ceiling with a coal oil lantern on it. And right at dark, Big Lou would go light 16 coal oil lanterns with the reflection of those mirrors. What do you think that house looked like? Everybody else couldn't afford kerosene or didn't want to spend the money on kerosene because they went to bed when it got dark because mm -hmm. they had to be up at four in the morning to be at the barn, get the mules saddled and, 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 and put the uh, plows and harnesses on them so they could be at work at daylight. And so can you imagine what that house must have looked like and what that sound was? We've got a picture over there of the Rolling Stones that stopped by here uh, uh, in, in the early 70s. And the exact same thing that keeps... Keith Richards and, and Mick and all of them play on their guitars. All that was played right here on this front porch of this commissary, you know, long before they were. Well, I know they give the nod to yeah, the blues yeah. being the Yeah, the exactly, bass. exactly. And so a lot of their inspiration, you know, uh, came from that kind of music that was developed right here at Dockery and right here on that front porch. They all came to play here, not just with Charlie Patton, but because of the crowd. They could control the crowd. If there was a frolicking house in Tutwiler, it'd be in the middle of a cotton field. And those men and women couldn't dig a moat around it and put live alligators in it. And they didn't have electricity, so they couldn't put electric fence around it. So cheaters like you and you and me, we wouldn't pay our 25 cents. Ah. We'd just stand out in the field and listen for free. Uh -huh. Ah, but not here at Dockery. Thousand grown men, because you've got to remember there were two to three to four thousand people working here at one time. So a thousand grown men would be here on Saturday afternoon late, just gotten paid with um, not that kind of money, with it, with Dockery money, and here it is right here. This is a piece of Dockery money they got paid with. Will Dockery, Dockery, Mississippi, redeemable in merchandise, 50 cents. And so now, those people will be standing out here, look, with a pocket full of money. The blues will play for free here for a few minutes cross the one lane bridge. You couldn't cross the bridge because there were takers standing there. Charlie Patton and them would hire two men to take your money. You couldn't cross the bridge unless you paid. A thousand grown men, 25 cents each, is 250 bucks. But were, was that, you're saying that was its own currency, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was kind of equivalent to a dollar? Like well, the, it well was, it, Mr. Dockery made it 50 cents in Cleveland and 50 cents in Ruble. If you wanted to go and spend your money in Cleveland and Ruble, the people in Cleveland and Ruble, that was very unusual. Uh, most, most, most farmers didn't do that, but he did it okay. because he didn't want to cheat the people. And so they could, then the people in Ruble would bring the money back to him and he'd give them real American money for it. So a brand new car back in 1915, you know, didn't cost but $210. So 
So Charlie Patton could buy a brand new car every Monday morning if he played at Dockery. And so everybody else was making 50 cents a day. So you just think what that meant. Unbelievable. You know, white man Sunday school clothes and a brand new car. I mean, he was a rock star. For sure. And so now he didn't just stay here and play at Dockery. He did, he did just like the Rolling Stones did. You know, he went on tour in his new car. He'd go to Rolling Fork, which got hit by a bad storm oh, here. No. Tore it up. He'd go to Helena. He'd go to Tutwiler. Uh, he might go down to Vicksburg. You know, he'd make the rounds. And I asked Tom Cannon one time, you know, they didn't have hotels and things back then. I said, where did he stay? He said, Mr. Bell, he stayed with the cooks. He said he'd go find himself a cookhouse, and he would stay with her cook because he could get good food. <laughs> I said, whoa. Smart guy. Well, he was a smart guy, wasn't he? He always stayed with the cooks. And so my house is next door. That's where the, Mr. Dockery's cook's house was. Okay. So I'm staying where Charlie Patton stayed. Amazing. I built a different kind of house than was there uh, when I moved. But the original concrete uh, triangular blocks that held the house up were still there. And I still have them at, you know, down at my house next door. But anyway, so it drew all those people here, not only to play with Charlie Patton and learn from him, but to control this big crowd. You got to remember, there were no cars. Five miles to Cleveland, five miles to Ruval on Saturday night. Nobody wanted to walk all the way to Cleveland and then have to walk home at two or three o'clock in the morning. You know. And be back to work. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, and, and, and church. And so, um, um, it was a controlled group of people. Uh, and, and those bluesmen really took advantage of that, okay? Okay. Yeah. Amazing. And so, that's why all these people come here to actually see where all that music started. Because you hear Charlie singing on that recording right there. And now come over here, you might want to look at something over here. Here's, here's the only known picture of Charlie Patton. There's only one of him, only known picture. Now look at him, what's he got on? White man Sunday That's right. clothes. Yeah, come on now, a bow tie, like striped shirt. Yes. Yeah, I've actually seen this picture I mean, before. Yeah, yeah. He, he's cool. That's but here's cool. what you don't know. When this picture was shown to Howlin' Wolf, Robert Palmer wrote the only real good book on the blues. Uh, 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 in 1950, uh, called Deep Blues. Okay. And he interviewed Howlin' Wolf and Robot Pop Staples and Sun House and all these people that were still alive. And he showed this picture to Howlin' Wolf and asked him, what's Charlie doing playing that guitar in his lap? Howlin' Wolf said, well, he's showing off. He said, showing off what? He said, he's showing off that he saw the Hawaiians play here when he was a child. The Hawaiians came here in the 1880s up until the turn of the century for 20 years and played for all these isolated people. And what did they bring with them? The slide. See it in his hand? Oh, yeah. Wah, 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 wah. And so that's where the bluesmen all got the inspiration to use the slide because they saw the Hawaiians playing with it. I had no yeah, idea. Yeah, you didn't, did you? I uh -huh. didn't. Mm -hmm. But the picture tells the truth. Mm -hmm. Look at it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. He's playing it just like his friend played it. it is now, the house. bluesmen didn't want to waste their whole hand with the slide. So what they did was they, they were smart. They took a bottle and a file, and they filed a little line around the bottle, hold it in a hot fire for a few minutes and get it good and hot and drop a drip of water on it. And it would pop right there where that line was. And they'd file the inside out so it wouldn't cut them in the outside. And they slide it on their little finger. And then they could do the slide up and down like this and still use their fingers. Oh, my goodness. So they developed the finger slide. Wow. But look who brought it. This picture was taken about 1890. This is the man that developed the slide. You can see it in his hand. That's his name. He developed it in Hawaii. So wow. you didn't know that, did I you? I did not no. know that. See? I did not know see, that. See, see, see. It's worth coming here, wasn't it? So it's my understanding that the picture we were looking at is probably the only picture of Charlie Patton. That's what he said, and that's what I've heard now, too. So if you've ever seen a photo of him, I had seen it before. It's probably what the photo we were looking at. Yes. He's very well-dressed, guitar right on his lap, but, yeah, but, but like, down, kind yeah. of more down. Yeah. Um, that was kind of what he was known for being well-dressed and that playing style and... And now you know why yeah. he was so well dressed. If he can buy a new car <laughs> with his two hundred and fifty dollars from playing a night at Dockery, if he can buy a new car every Monday morning, wow! And you know what's interesting to think too. We've we've talked about that the community 
on this plantation and in this farm area was so tight knit because they lived there. Well, these blues players, they could also, they would get hired out for parties too, outside of that farm. And, and it would be good money too. I think I read, you know, it could be $25 to perform at a party. Okay. Compare that to 50 cents a day. You're right? still yeah. way out of a, you know, in a different league. But my goodness, two hundred and fifty dollars. Because I mean, yeah, as as he described, and that would be in I guess Dockery currency, which is so cool to think about. It really just is how insular they yeah, really yeah, were. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so yeah, very very well off, and I I just thought it was just so cool to think about how just organic this all happened you know if you if you listen to the lyrics of blues lyrics it really is about the two mules the heat the 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 working conditions yes the yeah yeah so i just love that we have sort of a in a canon of history a place to go and visit and we we still even want to share with you a little bit about what William shared with us about like what was life like not necessarily as a musician on the farm but just growing up there living there yeah it's just like it's not possible for us to really understand about the blues by standing here today and Uh, trying to look back a hundred years we have no idea what those people felt like Um, you can think you know what they felt like but you can't because sometimes I've asked some of them in their 80s and 90s I say what was it like when you were a child here some them say, you can't believe it. It was wonderful. I said, nothing bad ever happened to you? He said, no. Some of them said, I didn't even know I was black till I was about 15. You know, he said, just, you know, people treated each other uh, in a different sort of way. Now, that wasn't everywhere in the Delta, but here it was. And, and so, you know, I, I said, what would you do as a kid? He said, Mr. Bill, we go pick blackberries and catch brim fishes out of the river and walk up to the highway, which was a mile from here, and hold them up, and he said, people stop and give us a dollar. He said, I could buy more candy with a dollar than I could eat in a month. He said, we do that almost every day. He said, every day, anything we could sell on the highway, we just hold it up, people stop them. He said, everything was a dollar. And I thought, okay. isn't that unbelievable? It's unbelievable. And, and so, you know, it, it, there were hard times. Now, that, now, I'm not trying to uh, glass over the difficulties that people lived through. I'm just telling you. It was also good here in the Delta, too. And Mr. Dockery was good to these people. Yeah, he was. He, he needed their help, and I think he um, understood uh, that the entertainment that they were trying to get um, uh, would be helpful to them in some way rather than trying to clamp down on everybody and, and, and be some kind of tyrant. You know? yeah. I don't think he was that way. I never met him because he died long before I was born. But... Uh, you know, I, I we just, all want the same things, yeah. don't we? Yeah, oh, happiness yeah. and a little joy. Yeah, and, yeah. All right, and, and try to help other people. That's right. You know, but we want the other people to do what they're supposed to do too. That's right. You got, you got to remember that. That that's part of it. You know, we can do our part, but they have to do their part too. That's right. And so I think he felt that way too. Well, William Lester is such a delight, and. I wanted to just give a little plug for his artwork and his turkey trumpets or turkey calls. Yes. So you can follow him on Instagram at William Lester Trumpets. And through that, get in contact with him if you're interested in either a turkey call or his artwork was just very, very Delta driven, very um, had, it was collage-ish. Yeah. like. Yeah. But tells a story from the Delta. Yeah. So, so we, in our Cleveland episode, our Visit Cleveland episode, we actually shared that we had stayed at a nearby hotel in Cleveland called the Cotton House. If you stay there, you will see William's artwork in different in areas many of, of the, the hotel. Rooms and, yeah. He joked ours was, you know, above the toilet and, <laughs> that, that we were in our room. that we were asking him about to tell us about. You know, he just thought he was a, it was above the throne. I think is what he yeah, said. Yeah, so. but yeah, he's definitely worth checking out. And um, if you make the trip to Dockery, you're gonna hear his voice, whether or not he's on property. They play his yeah audio yeah in different parts of the farm. Yeah, but they do they want you to come visit. Yes. So call for a tour. 
or just come by. Like I said, we'd recommend just staying right there in Cleveland. And if you are enjoying this show, we would just like to say that the greatest thing you can do is to share it with a friend. So would you text a link to this show right now to someone you think might enjoy some uplifting Southern culture? Thank you for enjoying Dockery Farms with us. We hope that you too get to make it there someday. And have a great week. Peace be with y'all.